I never said no to the college asking for the right to enter my my practice and investigate, but I said why. Uh, and I said why a few too many times. And then finally, they just decided I was being uncooperative. Some of my other colleagues outright refused to participate in college investigation, feeling, uh, and with some validity, I think, given the way the college was acting, that the college was uh, on, a, on a kind of a, a hunt as opposed to being an Im impartial um, uh, impartial agent of justice. Right. But the college um, probably uh, ended the careers of at least a couple of dozen physicians uh, in the process of, of, in Ontario, either causing people to retire earlier than they would have, making them leave or, or taking their licenses away. <laughs> Mary Ugolini here with Rebel News, catching up with Ontario Dr. Mark Benoit to discuss his experience being investigated by his regulator, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, the CPSO. They launched their investigation after Dr. Benoit first joined me in May of 2021 during a time when he was simply asking government officials for the data behind the authorization and the approval of the novel COVID-19 injections for children and for sharing concerns about if the risks really outweighed the theorized benefits. Unlike many other Ontario physicians who retired early, left the province, or had their licenses to practice medicine revoked by the CPSO throughout the COVID hysteria, Dr. Benoit is still a practicing and licensed physician, and we will discuss why that may be. In our interview, Dr. Benoit begins by saying that things look better in 2024 than they did when we first spoke in May of 2021. So at the time that we first spoke, the concern that we both had was regarding the um, uh, vaccination, the COVID vaccines for children, and the fact that there wasn't a whole lot of information out there to, to assuage concerns that maybe they weren't fully researched, uh, maybe they weren't fully um, established as being safe. And uh, um, after that, uh, I went to work with, uh, at the time, a Minister of Parliament, um, Derek Sloan, in order to uh, set a petition before Parliament asking that the child COVID vaccines be uh, uh, suspended. Uh, in their rollout until uh, safety studies had been conducted. So we obtained 28,000 signatures. I don't know. I think the threshold is 500, uh, above which the uh, petition is supposed to be heard in Parliament. So we, we exceeded the threshold, uh, and that was in the month of May. So that was a, you know, a month or two after the vaccines had rolled out. And um, then they called an election. Uh, and the petitions, all of the petitions that were on the books uh, were um, uh, thrown out, I discovered. So that all of that uh, effort was um, fruitless. Um, around the time that that petition was circulating, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario uh, informed me that I was under investigation. Um, it was somewhat unclear as to why, uh, because they didn't tell me we, what they, they didn't send me the letter of complaint that uh, that apparently had been written, and um, they they did make reference to the fact that it was regarding my um, my public uh, participation on the whole discussion around COVID. Despite a lot of public support, with questions and concerns similar to what Dr. Benoit was expressing at the time on important topics like whether or not the risk outweighed the benefit for the still in clinical trials COVID nineteen injections again being authorized for children, the investigation by the CPSO weighed heavy on his mind. Questions uh, didn't subside. It was definitely kind of sobering and intimidating to find out you're under investigation because one of the college's powers is to pull your license. And um, so that caused quite a bit of stress. Um, uh, I'd been told by my, by my uh, wife prior to all of this happening that I was really taking a risk by expressing my opinion. Uh, and my naive response was, well, this is Canada and you're allowed to express your opinion. Um, anyhow, it turns out that that's mostly true. You're allowed, but you also have to assume the consequences of what you say. As a result of expressing his opinion, including his expert medical opinion, providing a COVID-19 vaccine exemption to a mother wanting to hold off on this vaccination for her child, for this crime, Dr. Benoit faced a second investigation launched by the CPSO. I wrote a letter 
uh, of support to uh, a mother who wanted to defer COVID vaccines for her child. This was done uh, as part of a legal proceeding. And uh, the college then initiated a second investigation based on my participation uh, in that legal proceeding. Um, and so then I had extra kind of um, pressure on me from the college. And I was learning all the while about what it's like to be a physician who's working with a lawyer all the time. I was working with uh, Mr. Rocco Galati and his assistant uh, uh, fellow lawyer, um, Samantha Kumara. And along the way, learning an awful lot more than I ever thought I would want to learn about how administrative law works, how the freedom of speech works in Canada or doesn't work in Canada. And, uh, and so on we go. And then in the background of all of this were the COVID vaccines happening and reports of myocarditis, which was already known as a concern prior to the rollout. Um, and on, on and on, I, I continued publishing on Twitter and it, it occupied a substantial amount of my time, it was pretty distracting from my other work. Uh, and until finally it was uh, suspended by Twitter in August, 2022. Um, most likely because of what I had been writing about myocarditis. I never really found out why. After the Twitter, now known as X suspension, fast tracked to now, and Dr. Benoit has received a reprimand from the CPSO for not responding to them in a timely manner and a $6,000 fine for taking up their time. Dr. Benoit explains why he wasn't harshly punished, as was the case with other physicians in Ontario whose fate was not the same. I think that uh, I wasn't as willing to go to war uh, on the issue uh, as much as I recognized that this was the whole issue of the uh, way COVID was being managed, how our society was being managed, the role of physicians, the role of public health. As much as I recognized that these things were awful, I still wanted to keep on practicing medicine and I knew there was sort of a, a limit uh, in terms of the kinds of things I could say. So. Uh, some of my colleagues decided to bundle up the problems that they were having along with um, the problems that are currently unfolding, let's say, in the World Health Organization or the funding of vaccine research in the third world, all of which are really, really valid uh, uh, concerns, all of which are extremely important problems. But um, it's it's a long way outside of what's expected of physicians in Ontario and even in the freest countries in the world, I don't think physicians are really expected to to become political statesmen, stateswomen, in the way that happened uh, for some of my colleagues. Um, so I think some of my colleagues decided that this was a hill worth worth dying on from a professional standpoint, that they might help the world more um, taking a taking a public um, advocacy role than you know being in a clinic and seeing one person after the next. Mm -hmm. So that would be one reason. Uh, and then in the other, in some other cases, I think what happened, and this is kind of a related concept, is that freedom of speech was um, made into the defining issue. And um, it kind of, it missed the fact that the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario is more or less the police uh, for uh, the, the medical profession. So if a doctor commits identity fraud, if a doctor uh, has... Um, you know, sexually assaults a patient, all that stuff that falls to the college to investigate. And um, they're not to be obstructed in their investigation. And insofar as myself, I, I I never said no to the college asking for the right to enter my, my practice and investigate, but I said why. Uh, and I said why a few too many times. And then finally, they just decided that I was being uncooperative. Some of my other colleagues outright refused to participate in college investigation, feeling uh, and with some validity, I think, given the way the college was acting, that the college was uh, on, a, on a kind of a, a hunt as opposed to being an Im, impartial um, uh, impartial agent of justice. Another aspect of Dr. Benoit's sentence was to take a course on professionalism and medical ethics. This included writing an essay on preparing expert medical reports. He says that this process taught him how to better equip himself for these kinds of reports in the future, but also expands on how all of this was costly and time consuming, and none of his defense was covered by the doctor's member fee funded Canadian medical protective association this is my overall impression having spoken to my colleagues when it comes to being sued by a patient for a problem the cnpa um 
the Canadian Medical Protective Association is wonderful. When it comes to college matters, it gets a little bit weird. Um, the there's no stated policy that the uh, the CMPA um, will not take on uh, a case of uh, professional discipline. However, um, it certainly felt like they didn't want to um, act in a completely lawyerly fashion in the sense of um, defending me to the utmost of their abilities. Um, the way they explain it, uh, or, or one way that I interpret it, maybe I should say, is that uh, when I got a lawyer from the CMPA, they said this was joint representation. And so they were serving myself as a client, but the other client they were serving was them, themselves. And so they could only defend my case to the limits of what was in their own interests. And so uh, I guess reading between the lines, my assumption would be that um, defending a physician who was making controversial statements about COVID against um, the College of Physicians, they didn't see that as being in their interest. So they still did help me quite a bit, um, but they, they drew the line at really giving me a vigorous defense. Since this, Dr. Benoit says that the CPSO is slowly returning to normal, and that includes finally letting members of the public back into council meetings and putting faces to names during proceedings. In contrast to when I was given the papers regarding my being investigated uh, and the papers along the way about what different committees had decided, they actually redacted. They removed their names of the committee members. They just had black square comma committee president or what have you, or whatever it was. But they, um, they said that they were freed of having their names given my propensity for uh, being open mouthed with what was happening. But the only thing that hasn't quite returned to a full resumption of normal are lingering vaccine mandates. So one hangover that we still have from COVID is that uh, physicians who haven't agreed to disclose their vaccination status uh, are still barred from working in the majority of Ontario hospitals. Um, the Ontario Hospital Association uh, still officially has a policy that COVID vaccination should be required for um, hospital workers. A number of uh, educational uh, programs. Um, in, in my day job as a clinical physician, I see lots of uh, um, vaccine requirements for different educational programs, and they all still have COVID vaccination as one of those. Um, so there, there are still areas within uh, healthcare where it, there's an awful lot of pressure uh, and or an absolute requirement to be vaccinated with COVID vaccines in order to work there. Um, so that part of coming back to normal hasn't completely occurred yet. Uh, and uh, to the extent that it hasn't occurred, I mean, what you're probably going to get is you're going to get a concentration of people in hospitals, physicians, and nurses, who are maybe not necessarily taking the clearest of views on the whole, um, you know, vaccine safety and efficacy discussion. Um, there was a, the Ipsos survey that you helped me look at that uh, Blacklock's reporter published uh, or they, they wrote about last week um, indicates that the majority of nurses as of last fall uh, indicated the reason for getting the COVID vaccines was to save their jobs. And that more than a third of the physicians said the same thing, that the vaccine was not for their health uh, or patient's health, but it was to not lose their jobs. And public vaccine uptake is at an all-time low, with a mere 15% of the total population currently vaccinated up to the current government recommendations. In discussing the role of the CPSO facilitated investigations and stipulations on physicians, Dr. Benoit wonders if certain rules that allowed physicians to come in from the state of New York produced a net gain or, as a result of their investigations, a net loss. I know of a bunch of physicians who left Ontario, went to the US. Uh, I know of a bunch who retired early and I know of a bunch who were suspended. Um, there's 15,000 physicians in Ontario, uh, probably half of those are family physicians. I don't know if my numbers are exactly right, but the college um, probably uh, ended the careers of at least a couple of dozen physicians uh, in the process of, of in Ontario, either causing people to retire earlier than they would have, making them leave or or taking their licenses away. Um, and if you multiply that couple of dozen by assuming each physician serves about a thousand, I mean, there's, you know, 20, 30,000 patients who lost access to a family physician potentially uh, through this whole process as a result 
of the way the college decided to react uh, to COVID and react to physicians who are behaving uh, ba badly, in air quotes. Just in closing, Dr. Benoit, is there anything here that we didn't touch on or discuss that you would like to get across on a larger platform? Um, if anybody from the uh, Ministry of Health for uh, the federal government is listening, or Health Canada, um, they still owe Tamara Ugolini uh, her uh, access of information request from 2021. She's now coming on three years since she's been asking uh, regarding the uh, risks and benefits of uh, COVID vaccines for children. So if they could get on that, it would be great. In closing, Dr. Benoit shares the steep cost with this entire investigation and thanks his lawyer, Lisa Bildy, and the registered Canadian charity called the Democracy Fund for helping aid in his defense. It was expensive. Uh, so for one thing, the just the drain that it put on my attention, uh, you know, the amount of effort I had to expend defending myself once I was under investigation was considerable. I put my booked off work a couple times for a few days at a stretch in order to put together documents for an offense. The first time out, um, the uh, Give, Send, Go app, uh, I was able to use that platform in order to, to crowdfund. Um, and that crowdfunding covered about half of my legal expenses uh, for the first, first, first few months. So that was a tremendous help. Uh, and I have to thank everybody who, who uh, supported me there. And then uh, once I ran out of any additional funds and I switched over to the CMPA, they covered my expenses. But as I mentioned, uh, they had limitations in terms of how they would defend me. Uh, and then finally, when I had to uh, seek private representation again uh, through uh, excellent lawyer Lisa Bildy, um, the Democracy Fund agreed to uh, fund all of uh, my legal expenses there. Uh, without them, I don't know, I probably would have had to have given up. Uh, and take a, a lesser, take take a, a kind of a bigger punishment than than I ended up getting. So well, I'm glad that they were the democracy fund. I have been investigating the safety and efficacy of these novel injections since May of 2021, when I first filed an access to information request with Health Canada asking for that calculation, and they've been filibustering it ever since. If you'd like to learn more on this topic, then please go to nomoreshots.ca, and there you can chip in to support this kind of work. That's nomoreshots.ca.